Nuez. I'm with RitSyndrome.org. And on behalf of our board of directors and team, we're so pleased to bring you this week's series of free webinars to elevate your understanding and deepen your knowledge of Brett Syndrome research and care practices. Um, your children are incredibly important to us, and having your attention and engagement today demonstrates your deep commitment as well. So we're really glad to have you with us today. <clears throat> Before we begin today's talk, if you're joining us for the first time, I'd like to share some brief technology points on how GoToWebinar operates. Uh, the audio feed is open only for our presenter, so you don't have to worry about your background noise interfering with the presentation. If you look to the upper right corner of your screen, you'll see a control panel window, and we invite you to write in your questions, any questions or comments that you have for Dr. Tarquinio into the question box throughout his presentation, and we'll answer them at the end. <clears throat> if we don't get to your question during today's webinar, we will work with Dr. Tarquinio to get all the questions answered through email. Um, now, if that control panel is distracting to you, you can click on the small orange box with the white arrow to minimize that window, and then you can click on it again to expand it if you wish to submit a question. You don't have to worry about taking a lot of notes during the presentation. We will be recording the presentation, and we will email you a link to that recording after today's talk. If you're having any trouble hearing the audio, check your device um, or phone and turn up the volume, and that should help. If you have any other technical questions or problems, go ahead and enter them in the question box and we'll enter them and we'll answer them throughout. But we'd like to go ahead and get started with our presentation today from Dr. Daniel Tarquinio, who's Assistant Professor of Pediatrics, Division of Pediatric Neurology at Emory University, and Director of the new Rett Syndrome Clinic at Children's Healthcare of Atlanta. Uh, Dr. Tarquinio is a child neurologist and epileptologist that many of us know. His research interests include the treatment of epilepsy and Rett syndrome, uh, validation and refinement of outcome measures for clinical research, which you'll hear more about um, in our webinar on Friday, and identification of neurophysiological predictors of outcome. Uh, after completing his pediatric residency training at the University of Florida, he began caring for children and adults with Rett syndrome under the mentorship of Dr. Alan Percy in 2007. He spent a year training in clinical research with Dr. Percy, working on the Rett syndrome natural history project, and uh, which is when I had the pleasure of meeting Dr. Tarquinio, and earned an MS degree in clinical investigation at that time. And as part of the natural history study, he helped to develop the Rett syndrome growth charts, um, which many of you should have in your possession now. And if you don't, those are available at rettsyndrome.org under the Four Families section to download. Um, Dr. Tarquinio then completed child neurology training at Boston Medical Center in a clinical neurophysiology fellowship at Miami Children's Hospital. In 2012, he returned to Rett syndrome research and care, working with uh, Dr. Walter Kaufman at Boston Children's Hospital, where he worked on both the natural history study and phase two clinical trial of IGF-1 as a treatment for behavioral symptoms of Rett syndrome. His research in the Rett syndrome field is focused on the association between anthropometric measures and clinical severity, and other interests in, and investigations include treatment of epilepsy in Rett syndrome refinement and validation of clinical outcome measures, and again, identification of neurophysiological predictors of outcomes. So we're really fortunate that Dr. Tarquinio is one of those rare breed of physician researchers who works both with data and in the lab, as well as in clinical practice. So he'll bring a lot of interesting information to us today. Now, if you, uh, many of you know, he's moved to Emory University and has opened a weekly Rett syndrome clinic and is part of the Intractable Epilepsy and Seizure Surgery Program. And he spends his free time, what little of it there is, with his wife and uh, being entertained by their three-year-old daughter and one-year-old son. So he also brings the perspective of a very knowledgeable parent to his exam room and his work with our families. So we're very excited to have you with us today, Dr. Tarquinio. Why don't we go ahead and turn the screen over to you and let you begin your presentation. <clears throat> and I'll remind everybody that if you have any questions for Dr. Tarquinio today, please enter them in the question field box and we will address them at the end of his talk. Thank you. 
Thank you so much, Paige, for the introduction. Uh, I only have one brief update. My daughter turned four last week. Uh, sorry, I forgot to send that along. So today, I'm going to be talking about uh, what I think is a pretty popular topic, seizures and epilepsy in Rett syndrome. And I'll go over, I'll spend about the first half of the presentation talking about uh, seizures and epilepsy uh, and what we, uh, what we know about these in Rett syndrome. And then I'll, I'll talk a little bit about the data from the Natural History Study on epilepsy. So just uh, very briefly, this is to highlight our new Rett syndrome clinic here. As Paige mentioned, we're seeing patients here on a weekly basis. Uh, we spend a couple of hours with folks when they come for the first time. We have consultations with a variety of specialists. and. We are collaborating with both uh, genetics and neuropsychology for translational research, as well as um, a clinical trial that we uh, are, are in the, uh, that is in the makings uh, at this point. So I'm going to talk about some basics. What is a seizure? Uh, what is epilepsy? How do we classify seizures? Why are they a problem? What causes them and, and how do we treat them? And then I'll talk about the natural history data. And I should add at this point that a lot of this material was borrowed from the traditional presenter of this topic, uh, Dr. Dan Glaze at Baylor, uh, who was kind enough to share all of his slides and material. A seizure, quite simply, is overexcited activity of brain cells. A little bit more detail, it involves repeated firing of neurons that requires a circuit that goes back and forth between the cortical neurons, the neurons on the surface of the brain, and the deep neurons. And that circuit normally functions with uh, a frequency and an oscillation. And if that gets out of control and hyperactive, you develop a seizure. The type of seizure you develop depends entirely upon where in the brain that happens. So if it happens in the motor area, you develop movements. If it happens in the sensory area, you develop unusual sensations. If it happens deep in the brain and on both sides of the brain at the same time, you develop a loss of awareness. And if it happens in uh, some of the temporal or frontal structures, you can develop nausea, changes in heart rate, uh, and uh, other phenomena. How do we determine if a behavior or a spell is a seizure or not a seizure? Largely, this depends on history. And I spend 95% of the visit just listening to families and getting a good history, and about 5% of the time examining the child. Um, the description of the seizure is critical, and the description of all the types of seizures. Uh, and often it's helpful if families bring videos. Everyone seems to have uh, a video camera in their pocket nowadays, so the more videos you can bring to clinic, the better. However, uh, even in a room of 10 neurologists, they will disagree as to whether or not a video is a, a, a video of an event is a seizure or not a seizure. And the real gold standard or definitive test is the video EEG. This is where a child is hooked up to an EEG and the video is time locked to the brain waves so that we can compare exactly what's happening in the brain during an event. Imaging tests can be helpful, but not particularly so in Rett syndrome and epilepsy. And then we have the question, if something happens and it's not a seizure, well, then what is it? Well, Dr. Glaze published the, uh, the quintessential paper on this topic uh, in the 90s. And he studied 82 patients, which was quite a lot in the 1990s, using long-term video EEG. Uh, parents reported seizures in between 53 and 77 percent, and that's breaking it down. He used the different stages, so 
uh, during the regression phase, after the regression phase, and in the older children. And all of the EEGs in the children were abnormal, but not all of them had seizures. Most of the quote unquote seizures that parents saw were not actually epileptic seizures, they were behaviors. In fact, 82% of the spells that were identified were not seizures. What were they? Well, they were twitching, jerking, turning, falling, trembling, staring, laughing, even pupil dilation, breath holding and hyperventilation. Most of the epileptic seizures, the, the seizures we would want to treat with a medication, were actually not recognized by parents. So you can see why the video EEG is critical here, because as I said, even doctors witnessing an event are often mistaken unless they have an EEG hooked up. The term epilepsy refers specifically to a condition where seizures occur without provocation. In, in other words, there's no fever, there's no infection, there's no trauma. And the individual has two or more of these events with no good reason. Uh, at that point, they have the diagnosis of epilepsy, and the standard of care is to start a medication to treat the seizures. In addition to that, we can often identify patterns or syndromes uh, that can help us to determine what type of medication to use and what the course of the epilepsy is like to be, uh, likely to be. In other words, uh, we can determine what the clinical features are. The EEG can sometimes help us to figure out if it's a, a seizure that only involves part of the brain or if it involves the entire brain. It might help us identify a cause, and it can help us determine whether it's likely to be limited in time. In other words, will the children grow out of it, and will they be responsive to, to treatment? Classifying seizures is very important, again, for determining which medications to use, and the basic classification of seizures is into what are called focal or partial seizures, partial is the old terminology, and generalized seizures. We can get more specific if a child stiffens, that's called a tonic seizure. Rhythmic jerking is called clonic. Irregular jerking can be myoclonic. A child who becomes floppy during a seizure can be atonic or hypotonic. If they develop excessive irregular movement that looks random, that can actually be a seizure and that's called hypermotor activity. And then, of course, people often lose awareness during a seizure, and that used to be called complex. Now we call it alteration of awareness. So the terminology that a lot of people have heard about, complex partial seizures, you can see here complex means that they are not aware, and partial means that it's only happening in part of the brain or focal. The EEG can help. And this is an EEG of a patient of mine who is asleep. And I think that most of the people, uh, even without knowing anything other than the fact that some of those brain waves are on the left and some of them are on the right, because I wrote it down there, will see that these big spiky activities uh, on the EEG are not normal. Uh, if, if we did an EEG on most children, we wouldn't see those. However, this activity that's happening on both the left and the right, so it's generalized, is not a seizure. This is a common pattern that we see in Rett syndrome uh, that is not something that we treat with anti-seizure drugs. The focal activity that you see on this EEG that's highlighted by the blue oval, you can see that it's happening on the left again, because I wrote left on that side, um, is also not a seizure. It is abnormal, and it hints at an area that might develop into seizures, but we don't treat this. So if you have a child who has an abnormal EEG, you need more detail. Was a seizure actually captured during the EEG, 
or did they just have focal or generalized discharges that look very, very bad to an epileptologist, but are not actually something we would treat with a medicine? So when we talk about the type of seizures that people have and their type of epilepsy, is there a type of epilepsy that's not so bad? Well, you might consider that if an individual has epilepsy and they're controlled on one or maybe two medications, uh, those medicines uh, result in them having no seizures or maybe very rare seizures and they have little or no side effects from the medications, that's not so bad. Um, the fact is that worldwide, uh, about 30 million people have epilepsy. And so uh, that's the population of a, a decent sized country. Those, those people are, for the most part, doing pretty well. Uh, seizures can be really bad. And those are seizures that will continue despite treatment with medications, and we call them intractable. They can be very long, lasting more than five minutes or 30 minutes. And I put that here because uh, the, the term status epilepticus used to refer to seizures that lasted longer than 30 minutes, and now we've shortened that to five minutes. Or they can occur in clusters of seizures. Someone can have a seizure and then not quite return to normal and then have another seizure and they can go on and do that for hours at a time. They can, in certain circumstances, be associated with regression or loss of function. Uh, many folks have noticed that when their children started to have seizures, uh, they actually, this was actually accompanied by a regression period and that's what's called an encephalopathy. So the question is, is there such a thing as not so bad epilepsy? And the fact is, anyone who has a child knows that if that child were to have a seizure, they would feel like that was, uh, that that child was going to die. In fact, seizures are, for the most part, uh, not dangerous uh, if they're brief and they occur occasionally. But um, the folks at Gillette Children's did a study looking at all the features of Rett syndrome and looking at parenting stress. And they found that two features stood out as associated with parenting stress, having seizures and having uh, uncertainty as to abdominal pain. So why are they a problem? Well, I just said that they're not dangerous, but in fact, seizures can be deadly. Uh, if they last for a long time, status epilepticus is associated with a high risk of uh, mortality. Seizures can disrupt normal function. So if a child is seizing frequently, it's unlikely that they're going to be able to learn anything. Um, and as I say here, prolonged seizure status epilepticus is life-threatening. Uh, if it results in uh, vomiting and aspiration, that is actually uh, a common cause of death in Rett syndrome, which I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about seizures and mortality. Hospitalization is common with seizures. In the natural history study, uh, just briefly before I dive into the natural history data, 26% of everyone in the natural history study, and we have over a thousand people, 26% were hospitalized for seizures. And some individuals were hospitalized as many as seven times over the course of the study. So here is a figure uh, that you can see some blue and some red there. And the blue line uh, are the individuals who have seizures that are controlled by a medicine. And the red line are individuals whose seizures are not controlled by a medicine. There's a, a term called SUDEP that exists in the epilepsy world, and it stands for sudden unexplained death in epilepsy, it is a rare condition even in those who have epilepsy, but we know that people who have seizures that are not controlled are at a higher risk of sudden death, and as the term states, it's unexplained. They simply uh, don't wake up one day uh, because something happened in the middle of the night. The few that have been captured on EEG show that the brain simply shuts down. Um, this is 
are virtually eliminated if seizures are, got, are under good control. However, well, we just had a paper on mortality in Red Syndrome accepted and uh, to pediatric neurology, so you'll be able to see soon that um, SUDEP is not a common cause of death in Rett syndrome. In fact, there were no clear associations between someone having a seizure and passing away. However, as you can see in this figure here, uh, the line that's lower, the red line, indicates that uh, people pass away uh, from time to time at an earlier age. Um, age is on the, the bottom there. You see 0, 20, 40, and 60 years. And the probability of survival is on the left. So the folks with the blue line, uh, over 95% of them live to be about age 30, uh, whereas, whereas the individuals who are having frequent seizures, only about 80% of them uh, reach age 30. Why do people have seizures? Well, this is a, a complex question. Um, simply stated, it's a symptom. Yet there's a problem in the brain, and as I said, uh, there's irregular rhythmic firing that develops, it, it evolves into a seizure. In Rett syndrome, people have been able to explore through animal models why the uh, why seizures tend to occur uh, in the absence of functioning MECP2, and it seems that it doesn't have to do with the individual cells acting badly. Rather, the cells talking to each other produce an environment that is more likely to result in seizures. There are uh, chemical messengers in the brain that result in excitation, and there are chemical messengers that result in inhibition or suppression of activity. And uh, these are just a couple of them listed here, glutamate and GABA. They're not important for you to remember. But when this goes out of balance and there's a decrease in inhibition or an increase in excitation, the brain is much more likely to seize. The fact is, any of us listening to this call right now could have a seizure but we're very unlikely to because our excitation and inhibition are in good balance. This can very easily go out of whack. How do we treat them? Well, simply stated, we decrease the excitation or we increase the inhibition. Uh, we do this with medications. We can do it using dietary changes like the ketogenic diet, which I'll talk briefly about. We can do it using neuromodulation which is a term that describes what things like the vagal, uh, the vagus nerve stimulator do. But first, the most important thing is to make sure that it is a seizure. So what are our goals in treatment of seizures? Ultimately, the goal is no seizures, no side effect, treatment with a single medication that's easy to administer. Now, this is you may think it's difficult to achieve, uh, but I'll talk about what proportion of folks are able to do this. Um, we often will accept uh, occasional seizures with transient side effect with one or two medications, uh, and easy to administer, I guess, depends on uh, other circumstances. So other strategies that can be used in people who have frequent seizures or long seizures, we can use a medicine called diastat, which is uh, diazepam, it's a rectal gel. We can use other medications that are similar, like clonopin, clonazepam, or Ativan, lorazepam, which we can give uh, to stop the seizures from uh, continuing or break, break a cycle. The ketogenic diet is a very strict diet that involves giving a high percentage, a high ratio of fat to carbohydrates. When this is done, the brain preferentially uh, will, uh, will switch to using ketones as a food, and for some reason, this decreases the seizure threshold. Uh, it's not entirely understood why, but this treatment was, uh, has been
been effective for over a thousand years. Uh, people used to to fast and starve themselves uh, if they had epilepsy, and they recognized that their seizures would decrease after a couple of days when they used up all their sugar and they were simply burning fat. So you can't do that for very long, but what you can do is give a high fat, low carbohydrate diet. Um, it requires routine lab maintenance. There are a whole host of side effects, and this is best managed through a nutritionist and a physician who are familiar with the, with the program. The vagus nerve stimulator is a treatment that is sort of like a little pacemaker that goes in the chest and it sends, nerve, sends signals up to a nerve in the neck. It does not involve brain surgery. Those signals then go up to the brain and probably propagate up into the deep portions of the brain to affect the balance of inhibition and excitation. It's a nice treatment because of two things. Number one, uh, it has few side effects because it's not a drug. And number two, it comes with a little magnet uh, that a parent, for example, could uh, hold in front of the device to trigger it and deliver an extra boost of activity uh, if a patient were having a seizure or a cluster of seizures. Side effects that are common with these medicines are sedation, decreased alertness and communication, which are two different things, behavior problems, which can be very severe, they can involve depression, agitation, anxiety. Uh, rash is a common side effect, but a lot of people have rashes that are not related to their seizure medications, so it's important to talk to your doctor uh, if, you, if you see a rash. Weight gain or weight loss, depending on the drug, and then some medications can cause problems with balance or tremor. These are some of the strategies for treating prolonged seizures that I've already mentioned briefly. Diastat is the top photo there. Uh, that's the rectal gel. Uh, it's very rapidly absorbed. Within two minutes, it reaches the brain at peak concentration. Versed uh, is a newer approach in the US. It's been used extensively in Europe now, but this is a nasal approach. So uh, it's a little bit more convenient to administer, uh, and it seems to be just as effective. And in development is a type of an auto-injector uh, that is sort of like an EpiPen, which can be injected into the thigh uh, and deliver a medication in the muscles. So after you determine what to call these things with your neurologist, uh, for example, head turning spells or leg jerking spells, it's important to keep a regular log. And I always uh, show families this website, seizuretracker.com, is a free service. Uh, it's supported by the American Epilepsy Society. And it's available as a phone app so that if a child is having a seizure, uh, you simply turn on the phone and touch the app and it begins, it tracks the seizure, uh, it logs it in your log, and then you can actually use the camera to, to videotape the seizure at the same time. It's nice for us because if you provide us with your information, we can also uh, incorporate your medication usage and side effects uh, to see if the medications are helping or not. So what have we learned from the natural history study? Well, the natural history study at present has 1,131 individuals with Rett syndrome uh, or MECP2 mutations who do not have Rett syndrome. Uh, and this gets a little bit complicated to explain, but suffice it to say that uh, these are individuals who come to us uh, either because they meet the clinical criteria for Rett syndrome or someone found a MECP2 mutation for another reason, uh, and they don't, do not, for one reason or another, meet the criteria. The age range is very broad, from 1 to 66 years. They were followed in the study for up to nine years at present. It's still ongoing. And we've learned some important things from this study. Uh, currently, the, the data that, that are available in published form are primarily from, um, from cross-sectional uh, reports. Uh, one of the 
exceptions to this is the um, is the Australian report, uh, which is an excellent summary uh, that includes both cross-sectional and longitudinal uh, data. Um, but the nice thing about longitudinal data is we can figure out what happens to individuals who have seizures. Uh, you know, it, it might be nice for me to tell you, well, between 50 and 80% of girls with Rett syndrome will have seizures. But if your daughter has a seizure, you want to know what's going to happen a year from now or two years from now. So when we started the study, 55% uh, of individuals had a seizure at the start of the study, uh, prior to the start of the study. Only 29% of them were actually having active seizures when the study uh, commenced, and that's with or without control uh, by medications. 28% of individuals in the other 70% started seizing at some point during the study. However, 41% of all the people in the study stopped seizing for a period of six months. So you can see why I call this the epilepsy roller coaster. This is changing all the time. And by the end of the study, only 36% of the population were having seizures. So if you look over the 17 visits included in those nine years, seizures were present somewhere between 21% and 49% of the time with an average of 31% of the time. If we look at the worst seizure severity, the people who are having daily or weekly seizures made up a third of the group. This is overall. A third of the group never had a seizure during the entire nine years or pre prior to that. 16% of them had occasional seizures. 2% uh, seemed to have seizures, but the uh, epileptologist, or the uh, neurologist rather, disagreed when uh, additional history was obtained, and 19% were on uh, were on a medication but were not having seizures. Looking at different age groups, um, you may say to yourself, well, if my daughter doesn't have seizures, is she going to develop them and when? It seems that uh, the the prevalence of seizures, the percent within a, an age range, increases over time up to adolescence and then starts to decrease. So if you look at the green bars here, in the less than five-year-old group, only about 20% of individuals uh, had had a seizure at some point. If you look at the 15 to 20% uh, 15 to 20-year group, it's over 50%. And then after 20, uh, uh, only 40% of the individuals were actively seizing at that time. Because this is a longitudinal study, in other words, we, we follow people over time, we can use uh, something called a survival curve. Now, a survival curve is typically used to determine, um, uh, you know, in a particular condition, let's say a, a cancer or something like that, when do people pass away? Well, we can use it in the opposite way to say, in a particular condition, when do people develop something? And if you look at the bottom here, you see age from zero to close to 70 years. Uh, and if you look at the other axis, you see the percent who have experienced a seizure. And uh, over time, seizures become more and more frequent in the population to a maximum of about 90%. So if you look at uh, the average, uh, 50%, that is reached at about six to seven years of age. So by seven years of age, half of the population have experienced a seizure at some point. If you continue to follow people, some people begin having seizures in their adolescence. Some people begin in their 20s. Some people begin in their 30s et cetera, until over their lifetime, about 90% of individuals have had a seizure. A lot of people have looked at MECP2 mutations and seizures. And it may have to do with 
slightly different techniques of looking at these things, but people have found different things. Um, uh, again, the Australian group that I mentioned found that R133C was one of the lowest uh, uh, risks of, of having seizures, and they used that sort of as their baseline, and they compared all the other genes to R133C, a, a characteristically mild mutation. Uh, another study, uh, a recent study in Europe, found that R133C patients actually had a higher risk of seizures, uh, although they, had, uh, they were less likely to have severe seizures. So this could be due to one of, one of two things. Uh, either uh, we're looking at these data differently and we're coming up with different answers, or the populations are uh, different in different areas. And I tend to, suggest, uh, to suspect that it's the former, um, that we're looking at these things differently. But just to give you an idea, I, I don't want to belabor this point. I've divided these up uh, in a way that uh, Jeffrey Newell has suggested. If, if It's easier to think about things if we think about the severe mutations and the mild mutations. And then we look at who's having frequent seizures in those groups. So uh, it is true that if you compare statistically, uh, more people are having seizures if they have a severe mutation, fewer people if they're having a milder mutation. Uh, I'd also like to point out that one thing that uh, no one has, has really uh, commented on yet is that some of the mutations have a very low risk of seizures. Uh, exon 1 mutations, for example, which are relatively rare, less than 20% of the individuals with one of these mutations uh, has a seizure. And this goes along with our clinical uh, perspective that these individuals are particularly mild. If we look at the same chart that we did before and we look over the lifespan, we look at the people with severe mutations, the people with milder mutations, and then the individuals who have Rett syndrome but don't have a mutation in MECP2, we see that the individuals with, without a mutation tend to develop epilepsy earlier uh, in life. The individuals with the severe mutations are next, and then the individuals with the milder mutations tend to develop it later. Now, no one has reported this so far, uh, partially because no one has really had this kind of longitudinal data to look at. Uh, as I mentioned, most of the studies will take a population and ask them at a specific time, all right, are you having seizures? Uh, this actually follows them over time, the, the natural history study. And we can see that uh, it is true that if you have a milder mutation, you're just about as likely to have seizures over your lifetime, see all of them meet at, about, at around 90% at the top, but you may be uh, delayed in onset. When we think about the medications that are used to treat epilepsy, these are the most common medications that were prescribed in the natural history data. Depakote, an older medicine, uh, a very power, potent and effective medicine uh, with a, a host of side effects that can be managed, was the most common. Uh, over a third of girls were on Depakote. Lamictal was next. This is one of my choice medications uh, because it has the lowest cognitive side effect profile. And of course, our girls are, are suffering enough that, uh, from uh, communication problems. We don't want to add the burden of cognitive issues uh, on top of that. Carbamazepine or Tegretol, another older medication, was the third most common. And then you can see as you go down the list some of the other com uh, common medications that you'll recognize from your daughters. However, during the study, during those nine years, I looked at the individuals who came into the study never having had a seizure before. And the doctors in the study were not the people uh, prescribing these drugs for the most part. They were done by their local neurologists. And the most common drug to be started was Keppra, Leviteracetam. Uh, if you look, though, at the end of the study, the overall percentage was much lower. It was back down to about 15%. So 
a lot of people were started on Keppra and taken off. Uh, this is a medication in which about 40% of the individuals who start it will have some sort of a behavioral side effect. As I mentioned, anxiety, agitation, depression, uh, other mood problems. Uh, so it's, it's common that people will start it and then stop it. The other medications that were popular to start were trileptal, another uh, drug that I think is a very good choice. It's particularly effective when girls have seizures that only affect one region of the brain, uh, and Depakote again. If we look at how many medications people were on, uh, we, we talked earlier about how about a third of the girls had n never seized and never developed epilepsy uh, during the course of the study and they were not on any medications, about a third were on one medication. So these are the individuals who have not so bad epilepsy. Uh, they're on one medication, presumably uh, with few side effects, and they're, um, uh, for the most part, well controlled. The individuals who, who are on two or three medications uh, are the ones who have to be uh, aggressively managed because they're having recurrent seizures. And there were a few individuals who were on as many as five or six medications at one time. The other treatments that well, I talked about earlier, vagus nerve stimulator, and that's a little picture of the little pacemaker device with going up to the nerve in the neck, was used in about 6% of the population over their lifetime. And if we look at only during the study, uh, about 5% of the population were still using it. In other words, in a few individuals, they had turned it off. The ketogenic diet had been used in about 5% of individuals over their lifetime, including prior to the study. And during the study itself, only about 2% were still on the ketogenic diet, highlighting how difficult uh, a regimen this is to stay on. Another nice thing about looking at the longitudinal data from this study is that we could go back and say, okay, let's look at individuals who are having seizures uh, and they're not controlled and they start a new medicine. What happens? Well, these are all the medicines that were started at some point during the study in individuals who were having seizures. And I compared them using um, a, a technique where if they are above, if these black lines are above the number one on the left, that means that they're more likely to be effective than not. In other words, the odds that someone will become seizure free for two years because that medicine was added are two times, three times, four times if you didn't add that medicine. And so you can see the medications that uh, tended to help girls who ha were having seizures, if they started a new medicine, were all the ones that we've already talked about, Keppra, uh, Lamictal, Oxcarbazepine, Carbamazepine, as well as a few others. Rufinamide, or Banzol, is a newer medication. Uh, it's indicated for Lennox-Gastaut syndrome in the United States. Zonagran and Topiramate are cousins of each other. Uh, and they, they seemed to be effective as well. This is all retrospective. It's looking backwards. So it's not the same as a clinical trial where we start a drug and we see what happens, but it's still helpful. If we look over the course of the study, uh, remember it was nine years, uh, being seizure-free for several years, though, is, is a pretty desirable outcome, and 45% of individuals were seizure-free for over five years during the course of the study. Only 16% overall had frequent seizures despite treatment over the course of the study. So the question comes up often when you're on a medicine for a long time, can I come off of this medicine? I haven't had a seizure in two years. Well, it turns out because in Rett syndrome, the problem hasn't gone away. Uh, there's still too much excitation in the brain. The likelihood that you'll recur if you taper a medicine during the study, during our study, was as high as 60%. So someone had been off, 
seizure free for two to three years, medications were weaned, and 60% began having seizures again. If you waited four years of being seizure free, the recurrence was 50%, and if you waited five years of being seizure free, only 10% of the individuals who discontinued medications recurred. Five years is a long time to wait, but if you can maintain seizure freedom, your chances are very good, uh, according to our data, that you'll, you'll remain seizure free if you stop a medicine. Um, the question has come up, uh, are there other treatments for epilepsy, things that are not anti-seizure drugs? Well, I have to tell you, um, 31 of the traditional anti-seizure drugs were used during this study. I will, I will take, uh, I will take um, any testimonials from families, but I doubt that anyone out there has actually been on all 31 of these medications. And I've shown you already that if you change medicines, the chances that you'll become seizure-free are, are real. Uh, 13 additional non-traditional medications were used. These include things uh, like an Alzheimer's drug, memantine, Marinol, which is the other component of uh, marijuana. It's, it's used as an appetite stimulant in cancer patients. Naltrexone, which Alan Percy studied in a clinical trial. Prednisone and IVIG, which are used to treat autoimmune disorders. And then the question of CBD. So there are currently 15 studies that are planned or underway to study CBD. Um, I don't know of any other epilepsy medicine that has 15 studies that are planned or underway. So the, the truth is we do not know if CBD will be effective. Uh, we certainly know from anecdotes that it can be effective uh, according to, to parents. Uh, we also know from anecdotes that it can cause side effects. From parents. Uh, there were three uh, early clinical studies that looked at CBD in, uh, in epilepsy, and those were in the 1970s and early 80s, and there really hasn't been anything published since then. So the point is, natural doesn't equal harmless, and we really need to study this uh, in a scientific way to know whether it's effective or not. The key messages I'd like you to take home are that not all twitching, stiffening, staring, pupil dilation, uh, shivering events are seizures. A lot of these could be behaviors that are caused by reflux. They could be caused by agitation, anxiety. They could be caused by motor dysfunction, dystonia or abnormal reflexes. Or they could be autonomic dysfunction, which I think you'll hear a talk about later today. The EEG is always abnormal in Rett syndrome, but not everyone has seizures. So having an abnormal EEG does not mean you should be on an anti-seizure medicine. Video EEG monitoring may be necessary, uh, I would say is probably necessary in most cases to make an accurate diagnosis, uh, but in many cases uh, clinical history is enough. And over a period of years, a uh, few girls actually continue to have seizures despite treatment, only 16%. Uh, choosing a medication may seem frustrating to you folks. It's frustrating to us as well because it's really all about trial and error uh, and weighing the side effects in your, in your child. So thank you very much for your attention, and I'll take any questions at this time. Thank you so much, Dr. Tartinio. Um, it's one of the most informative presentations I've seen on seizures and epilepsy and Rett syndrome, so thank you for your thoroughness. We have quite a few questions in the queue, and we've got about 10 minutes left in the session. So if you don't mind, I'm going to try to take some that have a common theme, roll them up into one question, and hopefully they'll get answered. And as I mentioned before, we'll make sure to go over all of the questions with Dr. Tarquinio after we finish today and get a QA doc out to everybody so that your questions can be answered. So if you, um, the first one that I, I have is regarding um, rescue medications. And you had talked about uh, diastat and um, lorazepam. Uh, we have a family who also has clonopin on hand for a rescue med. Um, 
but they're concerned at just how severe the side effects are and how long it knocks her out to um, disrupt cluster seizures. So can you comment on that, like weighing the benefits of rescue medication and the fact that they just knock our girls out for so long afterwards? Yeah, this is a tricky issue. Uh, I came back to this slide, which is dedicated really towards rescue medicines when people are having prolonged single seizures. Uh, there are different scenarios. So if someone is having a seizure, an individual seizure that lasts for a long time, and that's generally regarded as more than five minutes or maybe more than three minutes, uh, giving one of these medications will help prevent status epilepticus, and it will help prevent hospitalization, and it will help prevent all of the bad things that come with hospitalization, including intubation and uh, various antibiotics, et cetera. The issue with cluster seizures is a little bit more complex because um, it, cluster seizures can continue to evolve into seizures that don't go away, uh, but uh, w w that's really a decision to be made in discussing it with your neurologist. The unfortunate thing is all of these medications on this slide, as well as clonopin and, and Ativan, uh, work in the same way. And they work as uh, sleeping pills, basically. They, they put your brain to rest by increasing inhibition. They shut everything down. And um, the duration of that varies. I would say that if, uh, your, if your child is knocked out for more than four to six hours after that, then you might want to talk about changing the dose of the rescue medicine. But um, really, I would say that if, if a child, if I'm dealing with a patient and they're having uh, more than three seizures in a couple of hours, uh, then I will recommend that they use some sort of a, a medicine to try and break that cycle. Um, it, it, it's a complex issue and, and uh, I'm happy to talk about it more if, if you want to give me more details. Okay, thank you. Let's um let's try to get a few more uh, questions in because there's some really good ones. Um, how about reaction? So continuing on the rescue medicine question, a reaction. Uh, a child had a reaction to Valium, but they've been prescribed Diastat as a rescue medication. Is that safe? So the reaction to Valium happened during an episode of Steve Johnson syndrome. Oh boy. Um, so if if they actually had Stevens Johnson syndrome, uh, then they should not have that medication again. However, uh, I've talked about this with some uh, PharmDs, some pharmacologists, and the no one is actually convinced that the benzodiazepine drugs like Valium and Ativan and, and Midazolam or Versed that they can actually cause Stevens Johnson syndrome. The, the stories, even within the medical community, are sort of anecdotal. Uh, most of these children are on other medicines, so you have to look very carefully at what drug was the culprit, what was associated with the rash. Uh, was that rash truly Stevens-Johnson syndrome, which involves um, the uh, rash of the mucosa, so within the mouth and the eyes, there will, there will be peeling of the skin in the, around the mouth and the eyes, uh, and it's very, very severe and uh, requires hospitalization in 100% of cases. But uh, that said, um, most people uh, who, who have a reaction, a diff I thought you were gonna go somewhere else with this, most people will say that they have um, some agitation or a paradoxical reaction to one of these medicines. And often the other medicines uh, work just fine. So even though they're all in the same class, these benzodiazepine medicines um, sometimes affect people differently. Sometimes they'll be a side effect with one, but not with another. Um, but definitely talk to your doctor about that with the Stevens-Johnson syndrome, because if that's true and you've proven that, uh, then you should avoid them with, as a class. Okay. Thank you very much for that. Um, I have another question, and this has been a common. This was a common theme in um, Dr. Souter's movement and motor disorder presentation yesterday, and I anticipate this a lot in our next presentation with Dr. Fema of autonomic dysfunction. And it's 
and it's been relevant in your presentation, which is how, really distinguishing between seizures, episodes, GI distress. When you have a nonverbal child who can't describe what she's feeling and where she's feeling it. Um, our families who've had multiple, and this is a couple questions that are in the queue, families that have had multiple um, prolonged video EEGs, you know, our girls just, they'll do their behavior at home and they don't do it in the hospital when hooked up. So, um, and they're, you know, really trying to figure out what's going on. Are there any devices or equipment that you know of that families can use at home, such as the SAMI device or others, to, you know, try to capture these episodes beyond cell phone, you know, video that can mimic a video EEG? That, that's really a great question. So there are a couple of things that are currently available. Number one, uh, there's a technique called ambulatory EEG, where the EEG is hooked up uh, in the lab, the, the family goes home and they go about their business, and the EEG is collecting data. Um, if, the, if the event happens, you simply push a little button on the ambulatory EEG, it, it makes a mark on the EEG, and then the epileptologist, when they review that several days later, uh, can see whether or not that was a seizure. However, uh, it rarely involves video, uh, you can try to videotape the event simultaneously, but they won't be time locked with the EEG. There are devices uh, that incorporate video EEG at home, but those are pretty rare. Now, there is another uh, device on the market that the, the, the release date keeps being pushed back on, but everyone's pretty excited about this, um, this Embrace uh, watch, which is was developed by a lab at MIT, and uh, it has been validated in a, a small population of individuals with epilepsy, not Rett syndrome, uh, to, be, to be able to detect seizures using other methods. So it's a watch that people wear 24-7, and it looks at skin conductance. So uh, when you have a seizure, you're, you release uh, a lot of activity into your autonomic nervous system and you develop uh, a change in your skin conductance. Um, you develop sweating, you develop all kinds of things, sort of uh, along the lines of how a seizure dog can detect seizures in an individual who has one of those. Um, but this watch will, uh, will, I think, help the epileptologist to piece apart these, uh, these episodes. If they see some of them during the video EEG and they're not seizures, they see this, something similar at home uh, that looks a little different to the family, then, then we could reassure you. Or if we see something completely different at home, then we really have to capture it on the EEG to be sure. Um, there's, when in doubt, we can always try to treat with a medication. Uh, and if the event goes away, uh, then we can, we can continue that medication. Uh, it, that's a that's a less than optimal approach, but I've done that before. Great. Thank you. That's a great answers. Um, I think I'm going to squeeze in two questions to you. Uh, we've got quite a few more in the queue and 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 some comments from different things that people are trying um, outside of the U.S. that maybe haven't reached the U.S. yet. And so I'll be really grateful if we can do this QA document. But there are two questions here. Um, one has to do with genetics. So uh, someone was asking if you have any information on kids with deletions um, and occurrence of seizures and epilepsy, if there's a trend there. And then the other one is um, questions on increase or change in seizure activity at uh, puberty and adolescence, and then again at older ages, like over 30 years of age. So what is, if you could revisit the age trend and sure. also talk about deletions real quick. Sure, sure. So when, when people talk about deletions, I think, I don't know if you can see this slide page with uh, yeah. the genotypes. Uh, mostly what they're talking about are things called large deletions, which you see as the bar. Um, if you look from the right, you see none, splice site, exon 1, large deletions. And in that population, uh, the Australian group actually found them to have the highest risk of seizures. Uh, in our group, it was about average. Uh, it was just over 30% uh, would have frequent seizures. 
And I use that terminology because uh, if individuals are having, um, you know, occasional seizures or seizures that are well controlled with a medication, uh, that is clinically less relevant than individuals who are, are tough to control. Uh, now, if it's your daughter who has them and she has a large deletion, well, these numbers don't mean anything. Um, the, uh, the risk of developing epile severe epilepsy, though, according to our data, is about the same, though, if, if your child doesn't have seizures now. If I go to the age data, um, seizures in epilepsy, uh, seizures in, in Rett syndrome are rare in individuals who are under two or three years of age, uh, which explains why this less than five years age group is, is only 20%. Uh, we, I did, a, did comment earlier that uh, if you look at the early adolescence and late adolescence groups, those are the ones with the highest prevalence of seizures, as high as about 50, 55% in the 15 to 20 year old. However, this is all based on points, at time, points in time. So if you look at that same population, you follow them over time, uh, it's not unusual when individuals are in their 20s or 30s for them to stop having seizures, um, either because of a medication or just spontaneously. Uh, they're on the same medicines, but then they stop having seizures suddenly. That can happen at any age. Um, so if your girl has seizures in, uh, in early or late childhood, they may stop having them during uh, adolescence. There's really no rhyme or reason to it. Uh, and this has to do with the fact that the brain is changing over time, and that balance of excitation and inhibition changes with the brain. However, statistically speaking, this late adolescence age group is the highest uh, prevalence. But I, I would reiterate what I said before, which is don't give up hope and continue to work with your, your neurologist to try to, uh, to manage the seizures. Okay, thank you very much, Dr. Torquinio. I think it's about time that we need to conclude our webinar for today. So I would just really like to thank you for your partnership with RettSyndrome.org, with our entire community. Congratulations with opening a new clinic in Atlanta. We're so happy to have broader access for families across the country and around the world as more clinics open up. Um, we hope to hear from you again on another presentation. I want to thank all of our attendees for coming today and asking such wonderful questions. We hope that you learned some valuable information that will help you manage seizures and epilepsy in your children and give you some reassuring um, data that she may not ever have seizures if she's on the younger end. And I know that you're worried that that might be in inevitable. And uh, Dr. Tarquinio shared that it may not be. So that's very encouraging. We want to thank our sponsors today, Toby Dynavox and Ameripride, for making these sessions available to you at no charge. It's incredibly important for us at RedSyndrome.org to educate you as parents, to empower you with information while we continue to raise funds and invest in life-changing research. So thank you very much for your support, both of our foundation and of your children. They're worth our every effort to overcome the challenges before them. And we hope that today's information will help you with those challenges. Thank you so much, and we hope we'll see you again in about half an hour for our next webinar on autonomic dysfunction with Dr. Tim Fama from Gillette University, or, yeah, Gillette Children's. Um, thank you very much, Dr. Tarquinio, and we'll be sure to get the remaining questions answered and out to everybody. Thanks. Thanks. Bye -bye.